competition keeps prices down far more effectively. As long as suffering of sudden being remains, I will remain in order to serve. I imagined God um, like my grandfather. In conversation tonight, my guest is perhaps India's best-known psychoanalyst and a writer to boot, or it might be more appropriate to describe him the other way around. He's lectured, been honored and feted at universities in India, Europe and North America. He's received three of India's most prestigious fellowships, the Homi Baba, the ICSSR, and the Nehru Fellowship. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Sudhir Kakkar. Welcome, Sudhir. Thank you, Raji. You re recently sort of published a book, The Ascetic of Desire, and you're all over the press um, with this book. It's your first foray, perhaps. Well, the second, uh, as, 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 as the interviews have, have, have painstakingly pointed out, <laughs> uh, but the best known, perhaps, right. um, foray into, into fiction. What encouraged you to go into recreating reality when you were dealing with reality itself? Well, exactly. The recreation was what encouraged me. Uh, also, I'd been do doing nonfiction for such a long time, and nonfiction has its rules. Uh, your imagination always kind of struggles against the facts. And so for once, I wanted to let my imagination be unfettered and not have facts circumscribe it, and which, of course, fiction does to a marvelous extent. But yet you have chosen a historical context uh, which in some ways does fetter you, does it not? Well, I think... Uh, this the interest of accuracy and authenticity. Right. Well, I think, that, I think this was the, the scholarly part of choosing the context, the period, which I wanted to get the details right or as much details as you can of the Gupta period, how they lived, what they ate, what they wore, how they spoke. But all the action or all the narrative within that was completely imaginary because one doesn't really know anything about Vatsyana at all except for one half a sentence in the Kama Sutra. So that you could create him completely, you could create all his family completely. So, so all that was kind of imagination. So it was imagination with a very kind of uh, small line of facts around it. Well, tell us what the what what the novel is about. Apart from the sort of the broad parameters that it's you know we we read reviews and we read the book that it's mm. about um, you know it's it's the biography of uh, the author of, of the Kama Sutra. Mm. But what is the underlying idea message that that that, that prompted you, encouraged you, mm. that excited you to write the story? Uh, the underlying message. Uh, which of course in fiction you always know afterwards. If you knew it before, it mm -hmm. wouldn't be fiction. It would again become non-fiction. I think uh, looking back at it, I would say uh, that the fiction should, or at least that is what how I like my fiction to be, expand your self, boundaries of the self. It should add to something of the self. Uh, it should do it entertainingly, yes, but uh, one should get something more reveal something gets revealed about your own nature and to me I think uh, the underlying message or intent is revelations about our sexual natures uh, but not universally about our sexual heritage what was Indian sexuality like what is it now so that one can compare it uh, contrast it so as to kind of relativize what we believe is our sexual erotic nature you said uh reveal your own nature. What of your own nature did it reveal? Or is that not sort of appropriate <laughs> for television cameras? <laughs> uh, I think uh, given the subject of the book uh, uh -huh. of sexual nature, I don't think that is such an appropriate one <laughs> for the television cameras. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But yes, there were always surprises for me too. Uh, when you were talking about uh, about context contextualizing uh, the, uh, the, the the heritage of Indian sexuality and and, and, and the relevance and, and how it compares with today, what are some of the uh, the comparisons that you arrived at? Uh, well, uh, I must start off that uh, uh, the world, according to Kama Sutra, is a very small elite world the, of the courts uh, and mm -hmm. the rich merchants. Uh, so only if you compare, uh, you can't really compare it. Uh, with the world of uh, 
our modern contemporary sexuality. But I think one thing which stands out in the ancient one was what they called the mariada, that everything has its limits. There is no, Kama Sutta is not uh, advocation of free sex at all. It is not libertine or license of sexuality. There is a very much kind of morality of sexuality with that, in that. So people knew what was right, what was wrong in the sexual sphere, which is, I think, compares, uh, I don't know, favorably or unfavorably with the confusion at the moment, I think, which we have in contemporary Indian sexuality. There is a confusion of what exactly is permitted, what is deviance, what is perversion, what is not. So I think this is the kind of comparison one can do with ancient Indian sexuality. What is the significance of uh, you know, the title, the ascetic of desire? Mm. Ascetics don't, are not meant to have desires in that sense. Uh, well, in this particular case, uh, uh, Vatsayana, who is supposed to be the ascetic of desire, to me, he was, uh, he was not uh, so intensely did he experience women, so great was his need for him that it frightened him to have this kind of intensity of sexual feelings, etc., right from beginning, that he, as defense against this intensity, he became an ascetic. Now, this is a defense against great sexuality, which a lot of ascetics, I think, do have. In fact, the ascetics are the ones which I often find are very much obsessed by sexuality, but in the mind. And I think this is what I wanted to portray Vatsayana also as. And we have many ad advan I mean, examples of ascetics uh, who are kind of uh, become ascetics because of the dangers, the threat the intensity of sexuality which they feel they cannot face. Who are some of these examples? <laughs> uh, uh, well, there is of course the public example, the modern ones, uh, which, uh, which, is, which is well known of uh, Gandhiji's great fights against his own sexuality, which he kind of documents all the time, which also took him to the ascetic ideals, etc. And then of course we have uh, uh, we have all the kind of ancient mythical ones. No? I mean, the, the rishis uh, whose eyes of just a menka, looking at menka and the whole sexuality breaks through. So we have lots of these struggles of ascetics against their own sexual natures, mm -hmm. of very highly developed sexual natures. Mm -hmm. And to me, Vatsayana was such a man, and that is why the title, The Ascetic of Desire. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that, um, uh, you know, sort of Freud's conclusions, and, and most sort of much of psychoanalysis analysis uh, has derived uh, from Freud, uh, and, and, and looking at the issue of sexuality, you know, repressed sexuality or misdirected sexuality as being at, at, at the core of the evolution of the human personality, and when, when that's distorted, there is a, a, a breakdown. Uh, are there sort of similarities? Are there connections that you were you found? Uh, well, not of course. Uh, in that period. Uh, I think uh, that period was very innocent kind of period about sexuality because sexuality was really limited to the body, to the bodily experiences, to the bodily positions, and that is where Kama Sutra kind of elaborates all kind of it. Uh, it was as if the persons did not exist. Uh, the, f the Freudian part comes in with the adding of imagination to the bodily act where then all the things like guilt and shame and disgust, all those strong feelings start getting associated with sexuality, which make it dangerous, which make it distorted, which make it perverted, kind of. Those did not, they must have existed in human beings, I do not know. But in the period, in the sexual text, the, like the Kama Sutra, sexuality is innocently, some would say refreshingly, and some would say very naively free of all the rest of the things, disgust, shame, mortification, fear of failing, and all those which exist together with it. In the larger context of sort of sexuality as, as a natural human instinct, uh, and, and looking at, 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 at what is sort of widely globally regarded as, as the great classic that originated in India, and I think there's a great deal of romanticizing about mm -hmm. India because of the text, mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is there a uniquely Indian sensibility in, in, in this context? Uh, if uh, the uniquely Indian sensibility, I think, is uh, of uh, sexuality as one of man's meanings of life, the Pusharthas, the four Pusharthas, like Arth, Kam, 
uh, and dharma and moksha so, and that calm is recognized as one of them but it is as part of the four it is subordinate to dharma which vatsana keeps on insisting so there is a kind of uh, 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 around it that sexuality is part of life and is not completely the life uh, which of course in many kind of sexual revolutions it becomes as say for in some western in the 60s well sexuality becomes the god eh, the big, biggest god so the, that calm would really become the biggest god and this i think was uh, circumscribed in the indian ones and then if you compare it to the uh, some of the chinese texts at the time the, the chinese texts are very much completely bodily centered in fact intercourse centered uh, and although kama sutta doesn't have lot of uh, room for feelings etc but it does have much more in the sense of uh, look at the woman what is she feeling before how to kind of diagnose she whether she is ready or not so there is some kind of feeling there is a uh, for the person it is not very so mechanistically that. so would you say then that uh, that was a period where there was very little romance uh, uh according to the kind of the uh, text yes i think romance uh, uh romance was really kind of a later addition to the our sexual corpus yeah there was there was little romance there was a lot of uh, desire there was also a great deal of uh, anger if the desire was rejected if there was all. so those kind of things were there but uh, but the objects of your sexual desire were more or less interchangeable and romance comes when the object of your desire is a constant one when it is not interchangeable so when did when did sort of romance evolve and enter the uh, shall we say the, the, the evolution of, of of sexuality in india uh difficult to say because mm -hmm. uh, i mean you could say from uh, uh, some of uh, some of the sanskrit plays that aha uh -huh, uh, the dream of vasudatta for instance mm -hmm. i mean when there is separation there's great deal of romance but it seems much more from the woman's side rather than the man i mean he can get the second queen and the third queen and it's mm -hmm. all right uh, so the romance is it, it may well be since we're talking about it is the creation of when women because start becoming more important uh, perhaps it is much more feminine in that one mm -hmm. whereas the men's sexuality is the heroic kind mm -hmm. of thing of interchangeable one when did it start i would have uh, very difficult mm -hmm. uh, that to say obviously the 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 writing of 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 a piece of fiction has been enormously pleasurable and and exciting for you uh do you see more of that happening in my case yes 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 mm -hmm. i'm already into my second one uh -huh. <laughs> i don't know how many i would write but uh, it's uh, it's something as i said uh, i thoroughly enjoy and it's a big change from my previous writing i will come back to my previous writing but i hope in a different way after my experiences of the fiction are you keeping up with your practice as 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 a psychoanalyst you meet see patients and and, and still work with that uh, i'm keeping up my practice only for short therapies because mm -hmm. i do not want to kind of devote long uh, time for psychotherapy so few sessions but not long ones which will tie me down so how would you describe yourself today as an author uh, or psychoanalyst <laughs> or um, Uh, well uh, i would describe if there was a word which kind of took the analyst and the author together then i would be that uh, word author analyst because to me they both do the same i mean the the object is the same of as we said of adding to yourself this analyst does it by entering the patient's imagination and increasing the patient's knowledge of his self uh, and the author does it by letting the readers enter his imagination so it is increased but the object i think is the same so if there was word for it let's put it hyphen between them <laughs> <laughs> in india we we were struggling with an acceptance of um, mental ill health should mm -hmm. i say or mental disease mm -hmm. and you're either sort of normal or you're pagal you're mad mm -hmm. you need to be uh, institutionalized mm -hmm. um in in terms of your practice uh how how would you suggest or what would you recommend or say is 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 the point where one needs therapy one needs treatment uh, even though you know you're not sort of out of control and and you don't have to yeah. be institutionalized what's the fine line 
we all go through periods of you know turmoil, unhappiness, happiness, mm. bliss, and struggle. Mm. When does it become a problem? Uh, it's it's really very individual, yeah. and there is really no fine line to decide. Uh, I would say when the person, whoever the person is, starts feeling the pain, the pain becomes so much that he or she feels that I do need help, I cannot solve it myself. So first, the, the moment you admit that there is something really wrong, which is kind of spoiling my relationships, spoiling lots of things in my life, and I need it. Now where this point comes, uh, it depends. I think the people who are very good for therapy analysis, this point comes much earlier because they are much more sensitive to themselves and don't keep on bluffing themselves for a long time. The others want to keep on their self-esteem up because to admit that there is something wrong with you needs a great deal of courage. So it is a very kind of different point. And then of course there are people who who won't go for analysis because they are not unhappy, but they make all others around them <laughs> absolutely <laughs> miserable. So they they kind of take out their things on others. And they will, of course, never go for therapy because uh, they are okay. It's all the others all around them who are kind of falling down and collapsing. You read less about therapy now, perhaps, than you did a decade ago. And you read more about uh, the, you know, the biochemistry of the brain and the biochemical interventions mm. that can bring about changes in, in personality. Um, are you are you despairing of that because it, it, it somehow diminishes our ideal of you know human effort mm. and sadhana and undoing karma, what have you, and you yeah. just fall a, pop a pill and you're feeling happier? Yeah, no, not not really. I think uh, the the biochemical is is fine. It uh, because any kind of illness is affecting all your bodily and your mental orders at the same time. So the treating of whatever is wrong has gone wrong in the brain the missing the chemistry putting it all right is I think is absolutely fine uh, the difference is that you always have a person who has that kind of illness so you have to treat the person to the experience of the illness the self-esteem problems which have gone together with the illness where it comes from so you if you the biochemistry will treat the mental illness the depression for instance the therapy will treat the depressive, and you need to treat the depressive also, and not just the depression. Uh, I think in, in, in the case of depression, perhaps uh, you know, the lines are more blurred, but with, there's been a lot of writing recently in the press about schizophrenia, mm. and, and, and how schizophrenia is something that can be treated with drugs. And, and yet there is a school of thought that suggests that uh, you know, uh, a schizophrenic is perhaps just uh, a very sensitive psychic who needs to be reassured that the voices he's hearing are, you know, are a product of this of this intuitiveness, mm. and there's nothing wrong. And it's because he thinks there's a problem. There's a problem. Mm. Uh, so, when, you know, where is the line uh, between uh, a problem that is biochemical and a problem that is, you know, one of personality, circumstance, uh, attitude? Uh, there is there is really such a shifting line. There's so many different views of it. Uh, uh, although schizophrenia, I would say, uh, is is a much clearer kind of a thing with for biochemical. But even a schizophrenic with biochemical treatment uh, doesn't mean that all his experience of schizophrenia. What is he going to do with that? Uh, he cannot completely lock it up. So he has to also integrate it of the kind of person he is in. So he would need some kind of, I think, therapeutic along with it. Not along because he's after he's able to establish a relationship after the biochemical one. So I think the therapy part would maybe less there, but I think it is all, always a, a combination, both the biochemical and the therapeutic ones. When we're talking about the mind, uh, India has a heritage perhaps of the best uh, mind training techniques mm -hmm. and, and, and being able to work with the mind. Mm -hmm. um, what echoes does it find in, in modern psychoanalysis? If at all, uh, I think uh, increasingly more. Uh, I think increasingly more respect. Uh, psychoanalysis is limited by its own assumptions of what a human being is, what human mind is. So it cannot go beyond that. And then, of course, also says there isn't anything beyond that. But there, I think there is now enough experience of analysts in other cultures with the kind of Indian training which they were looking down upon that they can also uh, work, but in a very different way. So it's like music uh, that I belong to this gharana. I'll start appreciating your gharana also now mm -hmm. and not look down upon it, but I cannot do otherwise. 
What does a psychoanalyst do when he's unhappy? Uh, does the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> does the same thing as uh, as uh, his or her patient. Uh, uh, I hope he or she cries uh, uh -huh. that he admits the unhappiness, feels it, and then starts looking for explanation that he does not foreclose the experience uh -huh. too early. I think that's what people do, that you start looking for explanation immediately. I hope a psychoanalyst would first go through the experience before looking for the ex uh -huh. explanation, in which case then you can deal with that unhappiness much better rather than why am I, why am I unhappy and getting so uh -huh. upset about it. So would you say a, a, a fair strategy or an explanation would be uh, to experience your experience and, and that as, 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 as Western psychoanalysts would suggest that, that most of our problems uh, come from repressing uh, our experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very much so. Uh, I think uh, because we are also afraid of and rightly of painful experiences that we do not want to experience them at all because we really fear how terrible they may be or have become. So we fantasize so much about our painful or bad experiences that we run away from them. But if you, and analysis is really a controlled way of experiencing your painful experiences and finding out, my God, yes, they are painful, but they are not monstrous. They are not so terrible at all. The monsters which I thought existed in my past are just human beings also. Maybe not that great. Somebody is stupid. Somebody was cruel, but not monsters. Mm -hmm. So once you find that, then you integrate a lot of your painful experience which you've kept out into your self and that thereby expanding the self. Mm -hmm. You've, uh, you know, you've, you've, you've done a book called The Analyst and the Mystic, and again looking at, at, at Ramakrishna there, uh, and, and, and looking at this aspect of the, the traditional, uh, well, looking at an, an archetypical Indian mystic mm -hmm. and, and trying to use and, and using the, 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 the tools of uh, Western um, uh, psychology. Uh, what were your conclusions? What, what do you feel uh, about someone like uh, Ramakrishna, the great Indian mystics, where do they fit into this map of, of normalcy, of, of, of reasonable human behavior, or do they not? I think they do not. I don't think Ramakrishna was a reasonable human being at all, and, and he would have been horrified if somebody had told him he was a reasonable <laughs> human being. He, I think he was a greatly natural talent of mysticism, so he had a great natural talent. So he's kind of like those untutored geniuses of a sports field who without training, but normalcy was certainly not his forte. Uh, and in fact, there were periods where I would say he was also clinically mad, which he also admitted, and other people also. So, so his kind of lines between normalcy, mysticism, and madness were so shifting that I don't think people could really identify who he was at what times. So if that, if that process, the process of surrender to the, to the mystical, perhaps to the abnormal, uh, is believed to accelerate the process of insight and enlightenment and, and, and understanding. Uh, what are the risks involved? Uh, the risks, uh, I think I, I'd put it somewhere that in, uh, it's such a surge of electricity or light that in normal people it fuses the bulb, in very few people it lightens up, the bulb lights up, which are the mystics. Uh, it is that the, all the process is much too strong you cannot control it uh, uh, without training. Uh, uh, so uh, it is diminishing of your personality. Uh, so the breakdowns are, are stronger. Whereas a mystic is in that sense uh, different. Uh, but what is it that sort of holds him, keeps him together and, and, and he doesn't collapse and you know, jump off a cliff or, 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 or something? Um, uh, you know, if, if we were all normal, that that we know of very little evolution. We wouldn't really grow. We wouldn't be breaking the frontiers. Yeah. Uh, so when is, is, or how far can, can, can one stretch the notions of, of, of normalcy before we collapse? Uh, is, is there an empirical? Uh, uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think there's a, you can only kind of uh, look from outside uh, how far, whether this person is crazy or is uh, in a kind So if you're a psychoanalyst and, and this patient comes to you and I come to you with whatever mm -hmm. series, when do you decide, look, this guy is, is in real trouble and he should be institutionalized or get medication or whatever? Mm -hmm. uh, what well, are the boundaries of normalcy? Well, one would be, I think I would look at the person's relationships. Uh, uh, 
are there no relationships or are they breaking down or is he kind of spreading love around him are the people want to be with him like to be with him so that is a uh, which is a quite a big difference between a mystic and a madman i mean a real mm-hmm. mystic spreads uh, affection and love and has very strong intense kind of relationships a, ma- a crazy man or madman so to say does not uh, so that would certainly be one there's even the physical part of it uh, the, in the madness i mean your physical part to, you really uh, it goes down hollow cheeks no, fo- no sleep no uh, this so i mean all kind of disorders which are if you, you see it from the face whereas in supposedly in a good mystic i mean there is a glowing face it's a kind of a thing so it says as the sort of your assessment of that is as much intuitive as it is empirical it is yes yes tell me there are sort of two 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 books we still have to talk about briefly mm. and one is the you know the first novel mm-hmm. that that you've mentioned and 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 the and the third one mm-hmm. that's in the pipeline mm-hmm. what was the first novel the first novel was uh, uh, about a hindu muslim riot partition time and uh, I remember the title the heavy knife it was called but uh, I didn't after I finished it I didn't think it was really any good it was kind of finger exercises so I didn't even think of publishing it third novel I don't want to talk about because <laughs> it is just since it's just starting and I'm kind of superstitious that if you in the beginning if you start talking about something you might talk it out and you'll never do it <laughs> okay so, well uh, how does the how does the process begin don't tell us about the novel tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about the process and then we'll, we'll com- you can come back to this program and we'll interview you again <laughs> when the novel is complete what is the process that involved how does it sort of take shape for you uh, again it's it's uh, it's, it's very di- difficult to, uh, it it starts with uh, some ideas rejection of those uh, uh, in, in reveries of scenes uh, whether they kind of interest me uh, then you <laughs> then you write something uh, i'm not the kind of uh, person who can really plan chalk out everything in so advance you, there it's are it's not structure that you don't start at the beginning and end no, up then no okay. I, I, i do try to start at the beginning and then find out that i'm in the middle so <laughs> <laughs> i look for the beginning uh, uh-huh. sometimes so uh-huh. well thank you very much it's been a great pleasure and we look forward to having you back on the program when your third novel is out thank you very much thank you very much thank you very much